Welcome to our study in the life of David. This is our 29th study. I was surprised to find that out. I went to go count up how many we've done and to find out that we're in the 29th study. This might even be the 30th study. I mean, I counted 29 and we may be in the 30th study. So we've been over a half a year already in the life of David. We will be covering part two of, chap of 2 Samuel chapter 16 through chapter 17. In, a, in this section, David has fled Jerusalem from Absalom who now is about to move into Jerusalem. And I think the reason that, J that David fled is because over a four-year campaign, his son Absalom had won the hearts of the people. He was savvy. He knew what he was doing. He was good-looking. He was charismatic. And he won the hearts of the people. And as soon as David knew that this was significant, he left Jerusalem. I think because he didn't want the battle in the streets of Jerusalem. And David had an advantage out in the field. He had lived in the field on the run from Saul. He knew the country of Israel for backwards and forwards. He was able to, do, to battle Absalom. That would give him an advantage over Absalom in time. Now, this turns out to be a very short and appalling reign of King Absalom. The, 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 we're basically covering his reign today, but he does have a short reign. This study is really about three different accounts of Absalom receiving advice. Two from a man by the name of Ahithophel and one by a name of the man of Hashuai. Ahithophel was a friend and trusted advisor of David who turned on him to give advice to Absalom. David is brokenhearted over this. David said in Psalms 41 about Ahithophel, even my own familiar friend whom I trusted who ate bread has lifted his heel against me. Ahithophel is also the grandfather of Bathsheba. And it may be why he left David and went to Absalom because he had bitterness in his heart and wanted to see David repaid for what he had done to his granddaughter and his granddaughter's husband. Now, this brings us to the first principle that we have tonight. And that is when you sin significantly, when it is a severe sin, especially, it could be any sin, but a severe sin, especially like the sin of David, you never do it in a vacuum. You never know who it will affect and how it will affect them. And so when David was looking on that, that off of the balcony, the porch, and he saw Bathsheba taking a bath and he was tempted, he was enticed, he never thought it would reach the depths of Absalom taking his kingdom, the results of what Absalom would do, and that Ahithophel would turn against him. Had he thought those things through, maybe he would have never have done it. And maybe in the midst of the temptation that you and I face, we would think about that as well. We can easily forget about what the results could be down the road. Now, Hashuai is another advisor. He's not as well known as Ahithophel. We talk about Ahithophel a lot, but Hashuai is another advisor. Ahithophel seems to be a better advisor than Hashuai, but Hashuai can hold his own. He's also a friend of David, and he was fleeing from Jerusalem with David when David basically said to him, why are you here? Why are you not back in Jerusalem with Absalom? What he was doing was setting up an, uh, an espionage ring with two priests, Zadok and Abiathar, and Hashuai, and the two sons would be runners who would meet with a young woman who would go out and meet with David. So David could find out what's happening in the court. So these guys are, they're moles. They, they are double agents. They're working for David but they're in the, the, as if they're working for Absalom. Now, David has three of these people that are, that are in this position. The title of our message today is The Day King Absalom Followed Bad Advice. And I'll give you a parent warning at this point as well. All right, we're gonna be talking about some mature things. Uh, and I've got a subtitle, The Appalling Reign of King Absalom. And it truly is an appalling reign that this, this young man has. Now, before we look at the text, let's consider a few things the Bible says about counsel or about advice. First of all, Proverbs 12, 5 says, the thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsel of the wicked is deceitful. So it's good to know that we need advice and counsel, but if we take it counsel from the ungodly or the wicked, it could be a very bad thing. And Absalom will take advice from Ahithophel that has other motives than, than what is really being seen. 
Now, second, Psalms 1, 1 and 2 says, blessed is the man who walks, in the, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So if we don't follow ungodly counsel, I think of how many places counsel is offered today. We need to discern what's godly and what's not. And to just oppose against ungodliness, Psalms 1 says, the, the blessed man, his delight is in the law of the Lord. In the law, he meditates day and night. If we find our direction or counsel from people that counsel from the Bible, we're going to be in a much better place than the ungodly. Now, another passage, Proverbs 12, 22 says, without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. So even though we don't want the counsel of the ungodly and wicked counsel is bad, we want counsel. We want to be talking with people. We want to find out what they think. We sometimes can just be thinking wrongly. We need to bounce things off of people. I find two things about decisions that I need to make or two things about decisions that the pastoral staff here at the church or maybe the whole entire staff needs to make. And that is, first of all, that we take time to think about it. That we don't just make a decision, but we actually put it in what I call the cooker. Put it in the oven. Let it marinate for a while. Think about it. It's like, Clarity comes with a little bit of time, not rushing into a decision, but also talking about it. I found that talking to my wife, she's very insightful. I found that, that, that learn, taking advice where you can find it from people who know the Lord and who are godly can be very powerful when it comes to making decisions. Now, one more. This is Proverbs twelve fifteen: The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. So when you're foolish, you think you're right, even though the decision you're making is wrong. But when you heed counsel, you listen to counsel, it's godly counsel and you take it, then you are a person who is wise. Now let's take a look at our text and see Absalom receiving bad advice that he takes, good advice that he doesn't take, and fake advice that he follows. So he misses it on every boat, all right? So here we go, 2 Samuel chapter 16, we're gonna start in verse 15. And this talks about Absalom coming into Jerusalem with Ahithophel, the faithful advisor of David. This is verse 15. Meanwhile, Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem, and Ahithophel was with him. And so it was when Hashuai, the archite, David's friend, came to Absalom, that Hashuai said to Absalom, long live the king, long live the king. And I wonder if Hashuai, who we know is a double agent, because we saw it in chapter 15, I wonder if he was thinking about David when he said that. Long live the king, long live the king. Not you, sucker, but David. Verse 17, so Absalom said to Hashuai, is this your loyalty to your friend? It's a little, little sarcasm. Why did you not go with your friend? And Hashuai said to Absalom, no, but whom the Lord and this people and all the men of Israel chosen, his I will be and with him, I will remain. Now, he resorts to flattery. Now, you, God's chosen you, Absalom, and that's why I'm here. And all the people have chosen you, and that's why I'm here. Now, he's lying. The Bible doesn't say whether things like this are right or wrong. It just gives descriptions of them. There's description in the Bible, and there's prescription. Description is when something's described. Just because it's described in the Bible by someone that we deem to be on the right side, a good guy, doesn't mean it's the, it's, it's the godly thing to do. If it's prescribed, God says to do it, then we're going to find out prescription tells us what to do and not to do, and that can be trusted. But I don't know what we expect a double agent to do when they're in the middle of a, of a hostile environment. How's he going to handle it? How would you handle it if you were a double agent that was sent in? I had a friend of mine who used to work vice and he used to tell me the stories where he's a strong Christian and he used to work vice um, in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he used to tell me the stories about working vice. And I would think, as a Christian, I don't know if I could do that. I really don't know if I could go and be that different person for a while that you had to be able to catch these bad guys. But anyway, I don't know why I told you that other than it happens. Verse 19, furthermore, whom should I serve? Says um, uh, Hashua, Hashua, should I not serve in the presence of his son? As I have served in the Father's presence, so I will now be in your presence. So Hashuai is a counselor, has been a counselor to David. 
Now he's trying to win over Absalom. How did he do? Verse 20, then Absalom said to Ahithophel, give advice as to what we should do. Now, there's no reason for us to think that Heshuai and Hithphel are standing there together while this is being done. This is over a period of time that Absalom asks Ahithophel, what should we do now? What should be our first move? Give advice as to what we should do. Verse 21, and Ahithophel said to Absalom, go into your father's concubines, whom you he has left to keep his house. There are 10 of them that he has left behind whom he has left uh, to keep his house. And all of Israel will hear that you are abhorred by your father. Then the hands of all who are with you will be strong. So his argument is that if you do this, your father is going to find it vile and the people are going to see that you're willing to stand against your father and their hands are going to be strong for you. What does Ahithophel really want? He wants to put such a divide between father and son that there can't be any reconciliation. Because up until this point, there's nothing that's been done that can't be reconciled. Absalom has won the hearts of the people, but God could work and David and Absalom could reunite. David could take his proper place and Absalom could be by his side. But Ahithophel doesn't want that. So he sets up this appalling act with these concubines. Now, concubine was not quite a wife, but you were able to to have relations with them. And so, why did David need 10 of them? David had Michal, Saul's daughter. David had Abigail. David had Bathsheba. David had Ahinoam. And David had others that we don't even know their names. He just said he took other wives and concubines at this time. So David has these, all these concubines. Somebody said to me one time, look, David had a lot of women. Why does God say that I have to be, you know, that to be monogamous? If David had all these women, it seems to me that it's okay with God. My response was, have you ever studied the life of David? Because it was the many women that caused him the problems. Had David not had concubines, weren't his wives enough? He had to have concubines? Had David not had concubines, this couldn't happen. Had David not sinned with Bathsheba, this wouldn't have happened. This was foretold when it was, the sin was revealed. This is the consequences of sin that's still coming out. And so it's because of decisions David has made that allows this to happen. Verse 22, so they pitched a tent for Absalom on the top of the house. One pastor said it would be ironic if it was the very spot that he spotted Bathsheba from, but the tent was pitched. And he went into his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel. Now, I wonder how Israel felt about that. I wonder how the nation of Israel felt. I wonder if he lost any supporters because of that. A little bit later on, we'll read of a man from Baharim, which is on the other side of the Mount of Olives, that helps David out. And so I wonder if he lost people because he had done this. Verse 23, now the advice of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was as one who had inquired of the oracle of God. So was the advice of Ahithophel, both with David and Absalom. In other words, it was really good advice. Ahithophel was a top-notch advisor. And he gave this bad advice, and Absalom followed it. Now, the next thing we see is that Ahithophel gives more advice. This time, however, he gives good advice. And the crazy thing is, is that Absalom won't take it. He gives bad advice, Absalom does it. He gives good advice, and now Absalom doesn't take it. This is 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1. Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, Now let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. And I will come upon him while he is weary and weak and make him afraid. And all the people who are with him will flee, and I will strike only the king. So he's going to murder the king. Ahithophel is ready to murder the king. Why? Probably because of the bitterness in his heart. Probably because his son-in-law was murdered by David. And so he's going to come with 12,000 men. David is running. They're tired. They're weary. They have yet to cross the river Jordan. And so he can kind of catch them, pin them up against that with 12,000 men. The people will flee and I will kill only David. That's murdering. It's not allowing them to surrender or capture them. 
but it's murdering. I will kill only the king. Then I will bring back all the people to you. When all return, except the man whom you seek, all the people will be at peace. And the saying pleased Absalom and the elders. Absalom was, was, I like that. My dad's finally dead. Now, why did Absalom have such bitterness against David? If you haven't been with us, then you don't know that one of his sons violated one of his daughters. They were half brothers and sisters. And Absalom was the full brother of the daughter who was violated. And David didn't do anything to Amnon for violating Absalom's sister. And when Amnon fled after killing, when, when Absalom fled after killing Amnon, David didn't do anything either. He just ignored him and left it alone. That grew into bitterness. That grew into such a hatred in his son that he wanted David to die. Parenthood that neglects is not really parenthood. And David is a good example in a lot of things, a bad example in some things, and parenting is one of them. And so this pleases Absalom. So then in verse 5, Absalom said, Now call his Shuai, the archite also, and let us hear what he has to say. And now comes in the double agent. This is like a mission impossible, right in the Bible. And when Eshuai came to Absalom, Absalom spoke to him saying, Ahithophel has spoken in this manner. Shall we do as he says? If not, speak up. So Eshuai said to Absalom, the advice that Ahithophel has given is not good at this time. Said Eshuai, you know your father and his men are mighty men and they are enraged in their minds like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. Now it is true. David has his mighty men with him. And they may be upset. And his analogy is a pretty good one. If ever you spot a cub in the wilderness, you need to find out where the mom is immediately, right? And you certainly don't want to play with the cub or pick up the cub because you're going to get eaten if you do that. And if you don't believe that, there's a channel on YouTube called Scary Bear Attacks. And you can read about people messing around with bear cubs and the results of that. So his analogy is really good. And that's a real YouTube channel, by the way. And because I watched a couple of them, they keep popping up. And then I watch them and swear I'm never going to go into bear country, ever. So he's got mighty men and they're enraged, like, like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. And your father is a man of war. And that is true. David's known for killing Goliath, a giant. David is known for fighting for Saul and becoming one who could kill 10,000, where Saul was attributed 1,000. David was known when he became king of settling the, 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 the uh, enemies that were around them and settling them so that they were no longer enemies. And so David was a man of war. And so he says, and will not camp with the people. So now he's just kind of throwing things in. Hithel is not going to be able to go find him and kill him because he's not going to camp with the people. Surely by now he is hidden in some pit or in some other place. And it will be when some of them are overthrown at the first. So these 12,000 men go and fight the mighty men of David, and then they're overthrown. They're, they, uh, that whosoever hears it will say, there is a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. So Absalom is a bad idea. There's going to be a slaughter, and people are going to hear about that. And that's not how you want your reign to begin. And even he is, who is valiant, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will melt completely. For all of Israel knows that your father is a mighty man and those who are with him are valiant men. Therefore, I advise you that all of Israel be, be fully gathered to you from Dan to Beersheba. That's one tip of Israel to the other end. Gather together the entire army with you like the sand that is by the sea for multitude and that you go to your battle in person. You, Absalom, lead the battle. Now, what is this going to do? First of all, it's going to buy David time because it's going to take a while to get messengers out to Beersheba and Dan and have them gather together. Number two, it's going to put Absalom at risk because Absalom is going to be out in the field. And Absalom is not like David. David is, David is battle, battle tried. The, um, I watched a, um, a documentary a little while ago on Caesar's battle against Pompey. Pompey had significantly more men, but Caesar's had been fighting with, for him for many years, and they, 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 this, they defeated this army that was like 10 times bigger than them, 
just because they were seasoned in battle. And maybe the, the general's decision, certain decisions that they made that I'm sure played a part of it. But that's how important it is to have seasoned people that are with it. And so to get Absalom out on the battlefield, he's bound to make a mistake. So he says, you go to the battle in person. This is a little flattery as well. You lead the people, Absalom. So we will come upon him in some place that we, he may be found. And now he gets very dramatic. And we will fall on him as the dew falls on the ground. And of him and all of the men who are with him, we shall not be one left that is so much as one. Moreover, if he is withdrawn into a city, then all Israel shall bring ropes to that city and we will pull it into the river until there is not one small stone found there. So Absalom and the men of Israel said, the advice of, of Hushai, Hushai, the archite, is better than the advice of Ahithophel. For the Lord had purposed to defeat the good advice of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring disaster upon Absalom. So what did it say about Ahithophel's advice? It was good. Had they pursued David immediately, they would have found him weary. They would have found him broken. Um, um, uh, uh, they would have found them unable to stand up and fight in the battle. And uh, they would have defeated them. But now this buys them time. So God was answering King David's prayer. When King heard, when David heard that Ahithophel had joined, this is what he said. This is 2 Samuel 15, 31. Then someone told David that Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O oh Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Now, we find the spy team, the espionage at work. They've got to get the information to David. They've got to get David off of that field, across the Jordan River, where they can regroup, get their men refreshed and strengthened, and get them back over again. So verse 15. Then Hashuai said to Zadok and Abiathar, so there's the whole team, right? The priest, thus and so Ahithophel advised Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and so I have advised. So what he wanted to do was get both of the, the, the information over there in case Absalom changed his mind and decided to do what Ahithophel would do. And so verse 16, now therefore sing quickly and tell David saying, do not spend the night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily cross over lest the king and all of the people who are with him be swallowed up. Now Jonathan and Ahimez stayed in Enrigel, for they dared not be seen coming and going into the city. So a female servant would come and tell them, and they would go and tell King David. Nevertheless, a lad saw them and told on Absalom. So one pastor said a little snitch. He sees them and he goes and he tells Absalom, and now Absalom knows that something's up because the sons of, 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 Ad, of Abiathar and Zadok are out in the field. But both of them went away quickly and came to a man's house in Baharim. This is the village that's on the other side of the Mount of Olives. So this is pretty close to Jerusalem. And they went down to it. And the women took a, and spread a covering over the well's mouth. So they went down to a well and she covered a covering over the well's mouth and spread ground grain on it and the thing was not known. And when Absalom's servants came to the woman at the house, they said, where is Ahimez and Jonathan? So the woman said to them, they have gone over the water brook. So again, we find another lie, right? Here in the Bible. And when they had searched, they could not find them. And they returned to Jerusalem. Now it came to pass after they had departed that they came up out of the well and went and told the King David and said, David, arise and cross over the water quickly. For thus has Ahithophel advised against you. So David and all of the people who were with him arose and crossed over the Jordan by morning light. Not one of them was left and had not gone over the Jordan. Now, later on in this chapter, we're told that certain people of the area gathered together wine and food and grains and they refreshed them. So there are people that are there that come alongside of them to refresh them. Sometimes there are those that are in the heat of the battle like David, and sometimes there are those that refresh the person that's in the heat of the battle. And we'll see that they'll be ready. They'll be, they'll be strengthened. They'll be rested. They'll be able to regroup. David's mind will be fresh so he can figure out exactly what to do in putting together the battle plan. As I said, this is old territory for David. It's brand new territory for Absalom. So they had all crossed over. Now, the final thing is that Ahithophel learns that his advice had not been taken. 
So, as I said, Absalom receives bad advice and does it, receives good advice and doesn't do it, receives fake advice and does it. Uh, advice that's a trap and does it. He misses it on all points. Verse 23, now when Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled a donkey and he arose and went home to his house, to his city, and he put his household in order and hanged himself and died. And he was buried in his father's tomb. Now, it's not a mistake that we see Judas in Ahithophel. As Ahithophel betrayed David, Judas betrayed Jesus. Jesus even quoted, my friend who takes the bread has turned his heel against me. He quoted David speaking of Ahithophel to speak of Judas. Now, he joins some of the rare people in the Bible that has talked about suicide. And we should talk about it because suicide is, is wrong. It's murder. It's murdering yourself. You have the power to kill people around you, but you don't. You might think, well, I don't have that power. Well, I'll figure it out. You, you're smart enough. You can figure it out. But you don't. Why? Because they're made in the image of God. Because you'd be taking their life because it would be wrong. The same thing is true about yourself. God has given each of us an appointed time to die. And we don't take our own life. Maybe you've been thinking about it, maybe even recently. Maybe that kind of surprises you that here you are and we're talking about it. And I will tell you that if you are thinking about it, know that God's got a plan and a purpose for your life. And whatever you're going through or, or whatever you're struggling with mentally or, or um, emotionally, you can get through this. That's not the answer. Leaving that wake behind you that unfortunately... I've had to lead funerals and celebrations of life for people that have taken their own life. The wake of destruction that is left behind is brutal. Sometimes it's even wanted. Sometimes they even did it for that very purpose. And if you are struggling with that, then get help. Let us help you. Let us at least be the first contact. Tell one of our pastors that's here, Tell me. We'll get you someone to talk to. You can talk about these things. But don't suffer with it alone. Don't keep it silent. Let us know. Let those around you that you love know that these are thoughts that you're having. And if you hear someone tell you something about it, then have compassion and be kind and look for ways to help. I'll also say while I'm talking about this, that if you are a woman that has had an abortion and you're just in a dark place and hard to find forgiveness, talk to us as well. We'll put you in touch with someone who can help you with that struggle as well. To be able to find the forgiveness of God. We, as I said earlier, we live in a unique time where people justify it. And then you find yourself doing it and feeling the weight of it. Find that help that you need. Find the help that you need if you are thinking about this, talk to us. Let us help you. We will help you. All right? This brings us to our final principle. I think of Ahithophel here taking his life because of the bitterness that he had for David. He wanted to kill him. Let me take 12,000 men. They'll scatter and I'll kill the king. But it ends up in his own ruin. And so the principle is this. Proverbs 24, 29. Do not say, I will do to him just as he has done to me. I will kill him as he killed my, my grandson-in-law. I will render the man according to his works. He murdered, I'm going to murder him. Do not say that. Because the bitterness that would arise. Had David not done that, had Hithophel not let that bitterness arise in him, then you would have never have had the short, appalling reign of Absalom. And what's going to happen to Absalom would have never have happened. Now, three things in closing. Number one, there is safety in the multitude of counselors, but not from wicked or ungodly counselors, right? So you've got to be able to discern who's a good counselor, who's a bad counselor, who can give you good counsel, and who can give you bad counsel. Biblical counsel is the best. Number two, related, as tempted as you are, as tempted as you may be, don't take advice that is unbiblical or ungodly. 
It may even seem like it's, well, you know, that's pretty good advice. You guys should live together first because what if you don't get along? That might seem like a pretty good idea. But do you know that people that live together before they get married have a higher rate of divorce? So the very argument that if you live together, you'll know whether or not you should marry doesn't really end up in the right place because more people get divorced when they've lived together. And as, long, as well as I'm giving out free advice tonight, let me just say to those of you that may be living together to, to move out. And don't use the excuse that's going to be difficult financially. Look, there's a God who will help you. There's a God who will bless you. You have a chance to really show your faith in him by moving out, by going and sleeping on someone's couch, by, by finding someone who will help you. Come to us again. Come to us for everything, but come talk to us. But I've seen it. I've seen people make a decision. I had a, a, a couple that came to the church shortly after they got saved. They were living together when they got saved. They didn't know what to do. So they decided to put two sets of sheets on the bed and one would sleep under one sheet and the other would sleep under the other sheet. Well, they came and they confessed that's not working so well. And I don't know that it would work well with any of us. I mean, if you're attracted to somebody and having a sheet between you, that might make it worse. That just might make it worse altogether. Having something be a little taboo and sheets between you, just not good. And so I gave him that advice. Move out. Do you have somebody you can go to? Well, it's good. We don't have money. We can be able to do that. Do you have a friend you can go crash with? Yes, I do. Well, then go do that. Move out. Let her have a place. And then set a time to marry, and I'll marry you guys. They did that. They moved out. Got married. He ended up becoming a pastor here at the church. God honored them when they did that, when they did what was right. And that may be a situation you're in. Find yourself being interested in God as a couple and you're living together. Now you've got a a decision that you got to make and that's okay. So be careful not to follow in biblical advice or in godly advice. Finally, God is at work behind the scenes. Just as God was at work behind the scenes with Ahithophel because David had prayed. Just as he defeated the advice of Ahithophel, he can do the same for us. As we call out to God and ask him to help, we don't always have to figure things out. We can put our trust in God and call out upon his name. All right, stand with me, would you, and let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for the time that we can spend here today. I want to thank you for the love and the care that you've given us, even as we take a look at David and we see his response and being out in the field and being on the run and how you took care of things with Absalom. And Lord, as we look at next week and we see the fall of King Absalom, Lord, we pray that we would learn these lessons ourselves. And if there's anything you need to do inside of any of us, I pray that you would do it. I also pray for those who have never given their life to you. I pray that they would give their life to you today in the name of Jesus, amen.